Assalamu alaikum dear students, I welcome you to my video lecture number 21. Uh, today we will cover the last part of chapter number 7 in which uh, I'll teach you some of the techniques, actually two of them, uh, in order to arrive at a unique IRR. So if you remember I'll go to this slide uh, right away. So if you remember, there are some possibilities where we have a situation of multiple IRRs. So my job is actually to calculate a single IRR, a unique IRR. So how do I do that? Uh, in my last lecture, I told you a distinction between a conventional cash flow diagram and a non-conventional cash flow diagram. So a conventional cash flow diagram is cash flow series is one in which the net cash flows send changes sign only once and if it changes sign more than once then of course it's a, a non-conventional cash flow diagram. Descartes rule what it says that the total number of real IRRs is less than the number of sign changes is less than or equal to the number of sign changes in the net cash flows. So for example, in this particular situation, let's say this particular example, uh, we may have two IRRs. So this is up to okay less than or equal to we we may have even uh, one IRR uh, but the maximum number of IRRs in that particular cash flow series would be equal to or less than two non strong criteria on the other hand it says that if the cumulative okay so this criteria is about the net cash flows okay uh, but non strong criteria is applicable based on cumulative cash flows and it has to start off negatively and what it really says is that if the cumulative net cash flows starts off negatively and has only one sign change there is only one positive root okay uh, and the book says that actually the non strong criteria is more of a discriminating uh, test okay so let's say if you have a situation of multiple IRRs, it discriminates one um, IRR from, uh, from another. Although it uh, is a little bit abstract, this language, but I'll show you through example that it is uh, not that difficult. In my last lecture, I told you that if we have a situation where we have multiple IRRs, I have to apply some techniques and arrive at a single IRR. Okay, multiple IRRs does not help. The reason it does not help, it doesn't give me enough information which IRR should I use for my project selection. Okay, so if I have multiple IRRs, I have to use these two techniques, the modified rate of return and the return on invested, invested capital to arrive at a single uh, IRR. In that process, since we will be using some outside information, information which is not included in the cash flow uh, series, that's why the rate of return that we uh, calculate is called external rate of return. So this is the process of modified rate of return approach it involves these four steps okay uh, so the first step is determine pw in year zero of all negative cf okay white pw actually i will explain in, in my next uh, slide determine fw in year n for all positive cash flows so negative cash flows will be brought to t equal to zero, okay? And positive cash flows will be brought to t equal to n. It will be taken to the end of the cash flow diagram. Why? 
although I will explain it uh, in my coming slides, but let me give it uh, a little bit of introduction. So negative cash flows is the money which is going out of my pocket. So it's a cash outflow. Okay. For any project, cash outflow is a money that is going out of my pocket. So where is this money coming from? For example, this money is coming from a bank. Okay. So I am interested in how much should I borrow at t equal to zero so that I finance all the negative cash flows. Okay. That's why we are taking everything which is negative to t equal to zero. Okay, so please, please, uh, please pay attention to my words. What is the present value of all the cash flows, negative cash flows, that I need to finance at t equal to zero? Okay, for positive, the reason we take it to the end, what would be, so let's say any cash flow which is positive, it means it's a cash inflow. Once I have a cash inflow, normally do not companies do not sit on those cash flows they invest it okay so if i invest a positive cash flows what would be the return at the end of the project so that's why i'm taking all the cash flows to the end okay step number three calculate the external rate of return and we represent it by i with only one dash or anything you can actually use your own uh, uh, what's this called? Uh, uh, you, you can use anything. You can use even IR. I, I don't mind that. Okay, you can use your own symbol. Uh, and if W is equal to PW, so if I convert a cash flow series into PW and FW, okay, I can find out a rate, okay, which is the external rate of return so that at this rate my pw is equal to fw okay so at what rate my converted fw is equal to my converted pw where is this conversion coming from from step number one and step number two okay decision criteria just like uh, the criteria that we use for marr the reason is err is based on irr okay so that's why we are using the same criteria. If it is greater than or equal to the minimum attractive rate of return, we accept that project. Okay. Let's uh, solve an example and everything will be crystal clear. So for the net cash flow shown below, find the ERR by the modified rate of return. So it's a technique. Okay. Method. If MARR is 9%, IB which is the interest rate on the borrowings is 8.5%. Interest rate of investment is 12%. Okay, so this is my cash flow diagram. Now, this is a cash inflow. Similarly, a 6,800 is a cash inflow. Okay, so this is the money which is coming into my pocket. So I would like to invest this money at II, of course, this is the investment rate and try to find out that if I invest $2,000 at t equal to zero, how much will it be worth at uh, t equal to three, okay? But of course, I have to finance these 500, uh, minus $500 at t equal to one and minus $8,100 at t equal to two. From financing, what, he, uh, what I really mean that actually I'm in a deficit situation. It's the cash outflow. Okay, so where is this money coming from? What if I borrow this money? Okay, and uh, finance it at t equal to 1 and t equal to 2. Okay, so my job is actually to calculate what is the present value of this borrowing. Which rate will I use? I will use IB because this involves borrowing. Okay, so I'm using two different interest rates for my calculation. For FW, for future value, I'm using my investment rate. And for my present value, I'm using my invest, uh, interest rate on the borrowing. So PW, as I said, 
I will discount $500, okay, for one year at 8.5, which is this uh, borrowing rate. And then minus 8,100 uh, present value again for two years, okay. F3, on the other hand, I will compound, okay, so calculate the future value. From compounding, I mean calculating the future value. So I will calculate the future value of $2,000 for three years by using investment rate, which is 12%, right here, okay? And this $6,800 is already at t equal to three, so I, I do not do anything with this, okay? So now I have two different numbers. One is my PW and the other one is my uh, FW. I use this expression, okay? So what interest rate, so what interest rate, okay? So this is I prime, okay? So this I prime is my uh, external rate of return using the modified uh, rate of return uh, technique, okay? So what rate will equate my FW to PW? So it's a straightforward uh, equation. Um, we learned it in chapter number one, actually, okay? So plug all numbers and you have your external rate of return by using MIRR, which is modified rate of return, and the answer is 9.39. Now, if I use the decision criteria, since my ERRR uh, is greater than 9%, so 9.39% is, of course, greater than 9%, so the project is justified. It means the project is profitable. Okay, so in this example, what we really did, we successfully, okay, calculated the uh, external rate of return by using modified rate of return. And although it's a repetition, but why is it called external? Because we are using some outside information. In other words, we are using some external information. And what are those external information? The information about the borrowing rate and the information about the investment rate. Those are outside information. All right, the second technique is called return on invested capital method, okay? So again, I'm calculating ERR by using this particular technique. And it involves three steps, okay? This one is a little bit complicated, but once I uh, solve a uh, few examples, actually two of them, it should be crystal clear, okay? On purpose, I chose little bit simple examples, okay? I'm planning to record another video in which I will solve a chapter and exercise which involves a little bit challenging question, okay? But once you follow the process, it is straightforward. There is no rocket science into it, okay? So measure what a return on investment uh, capital method measures, it measures, it's a measure of how effectively project uses funds that remain internal to the project, okay? So return on invested, in, invested capital, okay, is determined using net investment procedure. And what are the steps involved? Okay, I have to, calculate, okay, uh, the future value, okay, of all individual cash flows only for one year, and then I use a certain decision criteria, okay? So this is the general expression, and do not worry about this right now. Once I solve an example, you will be convinced that it is uh, straightforward. So what am I doing right here? I'm actually calculating the future value of my previous cash flow. So T minus one means that it's a future, sorry, uh, previous cash flow, okay? So what I'm doing, I'm calculating the future value This because this is the interest rate. So once I multiply anything with one plus interest rate, it is just like calculating the future value of this cash flow, okay? And then I add the net cash flow for that time period, and then I, use a certain decision criteria. If the FT minus one, which means that if the previous cash flow 
was positive. Okay, I use the investment rate. Okay, but what if let's say the previous cash flow was negative? Then I use the re return on investment on invested uh, capital. Okay, in some situations it's easy. Okay, it's easy, but in other situation it's a little bit complicated and it is difficult to solve with your hands. So you have to use computer. Okay, and I'll tell you how to use that computer. Not in today's lecture. In fact, I'm trying to um, record another lecture in which I will solve two different uh, questions. Okay, uh, those will be a little bit challenging. So my expectation is that you watch that video as well and at least uh, grasp uh, the idea. Okay, so that's the first step. Okay, second step, set future worth relationship for last year equal to zero. Okay, solve for i and that i double prime would be my return on invested capital. Okay, we use again the same decision criteria in which I compare my external rate of return okay, with MARR. If it is more than MARR, the project is accepted. Otherwise, we will reject the project. Okay, same example. Okay, but instead of MIRR, now I'm using a return on invested capital method. Okay, so same cash flow. Now, at year zero, as you can see, my cash flow is positive. Okay, so if zero is greater than zero. So what I can do, I can use the investment rate because it's a positive cash flow. I can invest it in a certain opportunity which can earn me an interest rate of 12%. So my F1, which will be like this, this particular cash flow will be compounded for one year. Okay, so once I compound it for one year, as you can see, $2,000 multiplied by one plus the interest rate, which is 1.12 minus 500, minus 500 makes it net cash flow. Okay, so this is the future value of the cash flow. And once I add, or in this, uh, um, in this particular uh, scenario, I subtract this $500, so this 17, 40 is a net cash flow here. So 17, 40 is a net cash flow at t equal to 1. Okay. Now decide whether this 17, 40 is a positive number or a negative number. Again, it's a positive number. So I will use my investment rate. Okay. So my year number 2 cash flow would be this minus 8100 plus another compounding compounded value of 1740 okay and the interest rate i'm using is of course the investment rate okay and as you can see now the sign changed at t equal to 2 my cash flow the future cash flow of course is minus 6151 okay so since if 2 is less than 0 so i cannot use my investment rate now now i can i will use what they call a return on invested capital. It is represented by I double prime, okay, for year number three, okay. So this is the equation that we are interested in, minus 6,151, okay. So the net cash flow was here, six, minus 6,151. What rate will make it equal to 6,800? That is actually my uh, return on invested capital. Okay, so it's a straightforward equation. You solve it, and your uh, ROIC is 10.55%. Since it's greater than 9%, okay, 9% here is given here. This is my MARR, so the project is justified. Okay, straightforward steps. Okay, you take individual cash flows. Okay, sorry, let me rephrase it for you. You compound individual cash flows for one year, find a net cash flow, decide whether it's positive or negative. Okay, so if it is positive, you multiply it with 
you compound it with the investment rate. Okay? And then you compound again. Okay? Uh, calculate the net cash flow. See whether it's positive or negative. In this situation, it's negative. Then the second year, you would like to compound it with ROIC. Okay? So what rate of ROIC? And actually, I stop here. Whenever I reach one period before the finish line, so this is my finish line, T equal to 3 is my finish line, okay? So once I reach at F2, which is minus 615, that is the uh, point where I calculate my uh, return on invested capital, okay, through this equation. Straightforward, okay? Now let's do another example, okay? For the cash flow series below, calculate the external rate of return using the return on invested capital, ROIC approach, with an investment rate of 14%. Okay, so my II is equal to 14%. Okay, and I do not have any information on MARR. So my only job is actually to calculate ROIC. Let's say if the question asked me whether we can accept this project or not, of course I need information on minimum attractive rate of return. Without that information, I cannot decide, okay? So the information is enough to calculate the ROIC. How do I do that? Start with t equal to zero. Decide whether this number is positive or negative, okay? Since this is positive, we can use 14% investment rate. Okay, I will calculate the net cash flow here at t equal to 1 and decide whether it's positive or negative. And again, I can use the same information again and again. Okay, so let's uh, move forward. How did I find a solution? Okay. Okay, so Descartes rule, how many signs does it change? You can see my first sign change was here. Then a change sign here, then a change sign here, and then a change sign here again. So there are four sign changes, which means four potential IRRs. Okay? Okay, let me rephrase. Let me choose my words uh, uh, correctly. Up to four IRRs. Okay? So it may be four, it may be less than four. Okay? Non strong criteria, it doesn't help. Why? Because the cash flow started positively. Okay? For non strong criteria to be relevant, the cash flow CD has to start with a negative cash flow. Okay? Um, this information is given. So, my first step is, of course, to, cal to decide whether my uh, first cash flow at t equal to zero, whether it's positive or negative. Okay? So, it's positive. So, I will use the investment rate. Okay? So, my, my net cash flow at uh, t equal to 1 is I compound $3,000 for one year and of course I subtract the $2,000, okay? My answer is $1,420. Again, it's greater than zero, so I will use investment rate again. I calculate F2. How do I do that? I use the investment rate compound 14, which is the net cash flow, at t equal to 1, for one more year, and then I add $1,000, okay? And as you can see, it's 2618.80, okay? Since again, it's greater than zero, so I will use, again, the investment rate, okay? At this point, at t equal to 3, you can see that my investment actually, the, the net cash flow changed sign, which is, less than zero. So now I have to use the ROIC. Okay, so F4, which is the, uh, the, the, the fourth here, right here, cash flow. Okay, and this, is, this was actually the last step because I already reached this point. And as I told you, that once you reach one period before the finish line, you stop there. Okay, then the next step is to calculate the uh, uh, ROIC. Okay, so my net cash flow at 
t equal to 3 is minus 30,000, sorry, minus 3,014.57. And what rate will actually make it equal to 3,800? It's actually 26.1. Okay. So if I draw it in terms of cash flow, yeah, so 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. Okay. And if I copy numbers, I have actually 3,800 here. Okay. And by using step-by-step -step process, okay, I have a cash flow of 3,014.578 t equal to 3. Okay. And it's a minus sign. It's a cash uh, outflow. Okay. So what rate will make uh, minus $3,014, okay, equal to $3,800. Or what rate will actually help me recover my investment? That's that's another interpretation of it. Okay, it happens to be 26.1%. Okay, so step-by-step -step process. Tomorrow, what I'm trying to do is I'll choose, as I said, a few examples where, let's say I have to use the ROIC somewhere in the middle because in these two examples uh, the one step before actually changes sign what happens let's say if it changes sign here let's say if it's negative here what happens okay so I'll show you those examples though they are a little bit complicated uh, but with computer help they are uh, easy to solve okay um, in my previous lectures, we talked a lot about uh, bonds. Okay, so bonds, it's a it's a debt instrument. Okay, why do we call it debt, debt instrument? Because if you are financing a project, um, you have two different options. In sim, of, of course, in a simple world. Okay, either you finance through equity you finance your project through equity or you finance through debt okay debt can be a bank loan or debt can be through bonds okay that's why it's called instrument okay um, debt in finance literature it's called fixed income security okay because the income attached to these instruments they're fixed they're already on a piece of paper okay so let me show you let's say th there there are no physical uh, bonds these days okay everything is what they call exchange traded everything is traded in a capital market for that you do not need any paper security like for example if you would like to buy any shares on karachi stock exchange okay you do not get any paper shares okay so no paper securities anymore uh but at one point in time those bonds had uh, paper security so this was a typical paper security bond okay as you can see this is the issuer okay this is the maturity date and i'll tell you okay what what maturity uh, date uh, means okay this is what they call the contractual interest rate it is also called coupons coupon rate okay so coupon rate Okay, and this is the face value, $5,000. It's already also denominated the, in number, numbers. Okay, so how do we calculate the rate of return on a bond investment? Okay, uh, again, super easy. But please understand uh, the, 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 how, how bond uh, actually works. Let me give you a quick... Uh, uh, info okay so suppose PTCL issues a bond okay face value is let's say one thousand dollars uh, and let's say instead of PTCL let me uh, take an international company let's say Google okay coupon rate is let's say five percent okay Coupon payments are, let's say, semi-annually, 
Okay, so two times in a year. Okay, uh, bond has a maturity of, let's say, five years maturity. Okay, for the sake of simplicity. Okay, so this is the way a cash flow associated with this bond will look like. Okay, so year number one, so this is zero, year number one, two, three, four, and five. Okay, so somebody buys a bond, okay, at what price? It really depends on the market. I'll explain it to you. Okay, but somebody buy, buys a bond here and let's say they pay P. Okay, the bond holder, so let's say if I buy that bond, the bond holder is entitled to the coupons. Okay, so the income associated with the bond is 5%, 5% of the face value. Okay, and it is paid twice in a year. Okay, so it, in one year it is 50. In half year, on half yearly basis, it will be 25. Okay, so 25 here, 25 here, again 25, 25, 25, 25, so on and so forth. Okay, so the bondholder will get $25, which is like the coupon. Okay, but at the end of five years, that individual will also get back the $1,000, okay? So the bondholders pay, let's say, P dollars today, and they are getting coupons, which is annuity, okay? And they also get the $1,000 at the end of the maturity, okay? So if the bond matures in five years, they will get back the money, uh, the $1,000 at the end of fifth year, okay? Um, some bonds, although it will be a little bit uh, on the side tracks, but some bonds are called perpetual bonds. Okay, so perpetual bonds do not have any maturity. Okay, so they are traded on the market just like shares. Shares do not have a specific life. Okay, so bonds uh, sometimes they are they have perpetual maturity, so they do not uh, mature. Okay, so the, uh, the 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 bond holder keeps on getting the $25 after six months, okay, forever, okay? Uh, and let's say if the, um, if the bondholder would like to sell it, they can certainly settle, sell it uh, in the market, okay? So let's not go into that uh, detail. A simple bond, the way it works, a borrower pays a certain amount for the bond, and then they're entitled to getting the coupons plus the face value at the end of the maturity. Okay, so this is the way bond works. Now, bond is a method of raising capital. Okay, funds by issuing IOU. Okay, so this is IOU. So let's say if I issue a bond, I owe you. I have to pay you some money. Okay, so it's a debt instrument. With face value B, coupon rate B, Okay, so this is like uh, this is the way we represent uh, these bonds. Uh, number of payments, payment periods per year, C. So in my example, it was actually two. So per year, the number of payments were two. Okay. Uh, dividend or interest. Uh, normally, it is called the uh, coupon. Actually, the coupon rate, not even the interest. Okay. And the time to maturity, N. Okay. Amount paid for the bond is P. Okay, so what would be my coupon payment? It would be my uh, face value, which is V, multiplied by B, okay, which is the coupon rate, and divided by C. Like in my example, it was $1,000 multiplied by 5% divided by 2. So that's why it was 50 divided by 2, which is 25. Okay, so the general equation, the way it looks like is what rate okay so as i said this is the way the cash flow associated with the bond looks like okay so zero one two three four and five okay and these are the cash flows so 
this is my AS, my annuity. Okay, and then I have a face value, which is here, right here, V. Okay, so I discount all A's, which is here, okay, by uh, through a P A factor, okay. What rate actually makes all my payments? Okay, so this is my investment. Suppose I bought that bond for $800. The face value is $1,000, but I bought that bond for $800. So what will make all my cash flows, okay, 25, 25, and then 1,000 at the end, okay, what rate will make the discounted value of all cash inflows equal to cash outflow, okay, that's the definition of IERR, okay, and in equation form we can represent it through this way, okay, so what would be my uh, parameters for uh, the factor? It will be a PA factor, okay? This I is required, okay? The I star, okay? Asteric. And then N is the number of, like for example, here, the number of payment uh, periods per year, okay? And then, uh, sorry, this is the maturity, okay? And then the number of payment per year is um, C, okay? So let's say if it's a 10 years bond, and you're getting coupons twice a year, so you have a total of 20 coupons, okay? Uh, and then same parameters for the, the, the face value, okay? Okay, once I solve for i, and solving for this i, again, it, mathematically, it is uh, close to impossible. So that's why you have to resort back to interpolation again. Or you can use, um, a Microsoft uh, Excel okay let me give you an example a ten thousand dollars bond so this is V okay this is the face value okay so the paper security again yeah? and then it's a ten thousand dollars okay it's like a ten thousand dollars note big currency note okay with six percent so this is the coupon rate payable quarterly okay so per year so C is uh, quarterly which is four in a year is purchased for eight thousand dollars Okay, if the bond matures in five years, what is the RO, ROR? So this would be the cash flow diagram. Okay, so the individual paid eight thousand dollars here. Okay, the coupon associated is six percent per year. Okay, divided by four, which is one point five percent per quarter. Okay, so my coupon would be 150 per quarter. Okay, so each quarter I'm getting 150. Okay, so this is quarters. Okay, this is year number one, sorry, one, okay. year number two, year number three. Okay, and I go up to uh, five years. Okay, so four and five. Okay, so each quarter I'm getting. $150. So A is equal to $150. Okay. And at the end, I will get, of course, the $150, but I will also get the $10,000, which is the face value. Okay. So I use this uh, equation. Okay. Um, and by definition, whatever rate uh, balances this equation is called IERR. Okay. In bonds terminology though, in finance we call it yield to maturity. Okay, so if I hold the bond until maturity, what would be my rate of return? That is called yield to maturity. Okay, so by using trial and error method, trust me, I have solved this. This one is 2.8% per quarter. Okay, so you can, um, I mean, uh, use your Microsoft Excel and then Calculate the uh, IRR, it is 2.8%. Nominal would be, of course, you simply multiply it by 4, it is 11.2%. But effective rate, because the question says, what would be the rate of return per quarter and what would be the rate of return per year? Okay, and per year would be 11.7%. Whenever we are talking about interest rates, we are talking about effective interest rates. Okay, IRR is the effective rate. 
it is not the nominal rate so that's why I'm converting this into effective rate this step honestly we do not need it you can straight calculate the effective rate okay uh, let's uh, solve another example so allied materials need three million dollars in debt capital for expanded composites manufacturing it is offering small denomination bonds at a discount price of 800 for 4 percent one thousand dollars bond that matures in 20 years with a dividend payable semi annually okay dividend I'm not very convinced actually about this uh, term because dividend is not only paid on shares okay I would call it coupon okay this is more a finance language okay what nominal and effective interest rates per year compounded semi-annually will allied materials pay to uh, pay to investor okay so okay let me tell you something else although so as I said bond is just like a paper security although we do not have paper securities anymore they are all exchange they are all traded on exchanges okay but let's say we have a paper security like this okay so the bonds face value is one thousand dollars if the bond is sold okay again the price of this bond so price of the bond is determined by market okay so let's say if the bond is selling at eight eight hundred dollars just like this situation okay we are saying that the bond is selling at discount okay if the bond is selling at one hundred dollars we say that the bond is selling at par okay but if the bond is selling at eleven hundred dollars we call that the bond is selling at premium okay so these are the common terminologies in finance bonds selling at premium par um, uh, what's this called a discount these are the terminologies that we use uh, in finance literature okay so let's uh, solve this problem so a person pays eight hundred dollars for a one thousand dollars bond okay which pays four percent okay uh, and the bond matures in 20 years so what would be the yield to maturity again technical term or the IERR okay so let's do that so cash flow okay t equal to zero it's eight hundred dollars okay the coupon is twenty dollars okay and this coupon is actually paid let me see it's a uh, dollars we live in payable semi annually okay so four percent multiplied by one thousand is forty and since it is paid semi annually so per six months the coupon is twenty dollars and please do not make a mistake where you calculate coupon rate based on the price that the individual paid coupon is always calculated on face value which is one thousand dollars okay so please take a note coupon is always paid on the face value that's why it's twenty dollars it is as I said one thousand multiplied by four percent divided by uh, what's it called two okay uh, this is if you remember the NC so N is 10, uh, 20 years and my C is 2 so that's why it's 40 okay and this I is steric which is the internal rate of return for this bond or the yield to maturity okay this is what is uh, required so by trial and error or through using spreadsheet function you can calculate that the uh, yield to maturity of this bond is 2.84 so the nominal would be and of course this is uh, semi annually so you just multiply it uh, with 2 so your answer is for nominal 5.6875 
0. But the effective would be, of course, you square it because the formula is 1 plus r raised to the power m minus 1. Okay. 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 It is 5.7678. Okay. It's a little bit higher. Okay. Than the nominal. Why is it higher? Because of the compounding frequency. Okay. Because it is compounded more frequently. Okay. Uh, you can, of course, we can use interpolation. Okay. And how do we do that? We already know about the cash flows. Okay. So let me make a diagram again. Okay. So $800 is my negative cash flows. This is what I paid for the bond. And then I'm getting $20 each uh, after six months. Okay. So this is year number one. Year number two, year number three, so on and so forth, we go up to 20 years. Okay. So the way I use interpolation, my first task is to pick the first trial. Okay, so my first trial, how do I do that? As you can re remember from my one of my lectures, is and this bond first value was one thousand dollars. Okay, you take all inflows to the end. Okay, it really depends actually how heavy are those uh, individual cash flows. If they were very heavy, to, which was like close to t equal to zero, okay, I would have taken instead, uh, instead of taking these cash flows to the end, I would have taken them to the beginning. Okay, you can you can certainly do that. Okay, so I'm taking all these individual 20s to the end. So 20 multiplied by 40 because there are 40 payments of $20 each plus 1,000. So I have $1,800 at the end. Okay, $1,800 here. Of course, I'm ignoring the time value of money. That is fine. Okay, I acknowledge that, but it really helps me taking the first guess as close as possible okay um, so what rate will make my eighteen hundred dollars equal to eight uh, sorry eighteen hundred dollars to eight hundred dollars in other words at what rate can I discount eighteen hundred dollars for 20 years so that it is equal to eight hundred dollars so 800 is equal to 1800 and this PF factor if I calculate it through this equation it is 0.444 okay and once I go to the factor tables I can see that for n equal to 40 so n is given actually okay the closest to 0.444 is actually 2% okay so that's my first try so if I try at 2% my discounted value of uh, the cash flow series it gives me a value of $200, which is greater than zero. Okay, so as I said, PW is equal to any cash flow divided by one plus I raised to power uh, N. Okay, so my job is to find out a rate at which my PW is equal to zero. So in order to reduce this PW, I have to increase I. Okay, so let me try 3%. Okay. Once I try at 3%, my PW is minus 30. This is what I want. I want one positive number and one negative number. Okay. So as you can see, my the rate at which my PW is equal to zero, that one is called IRR. Okay. Or let's say you can call it I hysteric. Okay. So at 2%. As I calculated earlier, my PW is 200 and 3%, it is minus 30. Okay. So, <coughs> part divided by whole, part divided by whole. So, this is the difference. The 200.01 is the difference between 2% and the, uh, the, 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 um, the rate at which PW equal to 0. And then this whole, which is 230, it is the difference between $200 and minus 30, which is 230.45. It is the whole. So part divided by whole equal to part divided by whole. My x is equal to 
0.87 so my IRR or you can call it yield to maturity or I whatever okay is 2.87 straightforward uh, today's lecture although it sounded a little bit complicated but honestly if you look at uh, the whole material closely it is super simple as I said I will record another lecture although it will not be part of the quiz so do not worry about that okay it is only for your own knowledge and of course I may give you uh, I may test you actually uh, on this material in the final exam so I'm not saying that this is irrelevant but what I'm saying is that my next lecture will not be super important for uh, will not be important at all actually for, uh, for for the quiz okay so I will record another lecture with uh, two more questions I'll pick them from uh, the chapter end and uh, once I solve them for you you will be convinced that the material that we covered today is not that difficult I thank you very much for your attention if you have any questions please do not hesitate uh, to send me those questions through my email I wish you all the best and have a wonderful day